Welcome back to our Sure Workflow webinar series, uh, our first installment of our every other week schedule, the second and fourth Fridays of the month. Uh, if you aren't aware, we have moved our weekly Fridays to the second and fourth, like I just mentioned, and then we're doing our Pro Tech Talks on the first and third Tuesdays. So kind of an alternating week setup between Tech Talks and Workflow webinars. Um, so today we've got a pretty sweet topic and some awesome guests. As you can see, we're going to be doing a little bit of a Dante deep dive. Um, so let's just jump into those guests that we have here today. So we've got Brian Reddy, account executive and system engineer with CP comms, who is currently at the U S tennis open in Flushing, New York, and has quite the Dante setup to go over and rejoining us for a second time. Thank you very much, Mr. Kirk Powell account manager with ATK. Thanks guys, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so let's kick things off a little bit here. Um, uh, let's start with Brian. Brian, why don't you just give us a little bit of your industry background, how you got started, you know, what you've done, what you're doing. Uh, just tell us about yourself a little bit. Sure, um, I'm currently in my, I don't know, 21st, 20 third year, something like that in television. Um, spent 15 years as a tech uh, freelance audio technician. And then the last six years I've spent, I'm a, the account, exec, uh, account executive systems engineer for CP communications full time. Um, currently, like uh, you had mentioned out here at the US Open, in my 19th year had at the US Open, uh, including the last six, uh, employing a full Dante network for all the uh, international broadcasters here on site. Um, I've kind of, I've done RF, I've done fiber, I've done audio. I kind of, I kind of run the gamut of, of, uh, my background in terms of television. Um, but you know, it's, it's Dante's kind of fallen into where I, where I've, uh, found my niche <laughs> per se. Um, so that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Awesome. Kirk, how about yourself? I know you've been here before, but we may have we have some new guests, I'm sure, some new attendees. So tell us about your, your career and, and what you're doing. Sure. I started out in live theater many, many, many years ago. That's what I have uh, two degrees in. Uh, and then I went into the theme park world. I worked on a Disney theme park over in Tokyo for about five years, and that was my introduction into network audio. Uh, after that, I joined ATK, wow, uh, 2002. Wow, it's been a long time, and that's where I've been immersed in television and uh, as kind of the similar world Brian's in. And uh, a lot of deployments of networked audio uh, it makes life a lot easier, obviously. And uh, I've had to cut my teeth and become an IT guy. So that's me in a nutshell. Audio in 2020. It's yes, somewhat, sir. Somewhat of the new reality. Yeah, fantastic. I feel like that's... Uh, part of the reason why we have so many attendees today, the numbers through the roof, which is awesome. Um, I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, we're going to go through some some of the, the things that we've prepared with Brian and Kirk um, here at the beginning. As always, if you have questions, uh, comments, concerns, please put those into the question chat in your control panel uh, for those of you that are attending. Um, some of them we might hold till the end. Some of them we might ask as they come through, depending on relevance. But we're, we're happy to try to get uh, as many of your questions answered as we can um, while we're here. Um, all right. So without further ado, Brian, I think we're going to kick things off with kind of talking about where you're at right now, um, and how you have set up and you were, you were nice enough to send me some photos. That, so I think I'll, I'll share my screen here again, um, pull up one of these racks or a couple of these racks you sent me and, and let's talk about, uh, what your life has been like for the last 21 days or so. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> awesome. Um, so some of these racks here were built uh, for various things at CP when we first started getting into uh, into the world of Dante. Like you said, I went, you know, I started my career carrying a cue box and a in a homemade voltage checker, and now I carry a four port switch and a laptop. Uh, you know, and <laughs> deal with a bunch of ones and zeros that I can't even see, touch, or or taste. You know, uh, so it's it is a whole new world. <laughs> um, but yeah, these these racks that you see here were designed in, uh, when we were first rolling out into CP. We had you know uh, got into the focus right world, uh, integrating comms and the one in the bottom, you know, feeding uh, some free speak base stations. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see like what would be like a truck rack where you've got a couple of audio engines. Um, for those that aren't familiar, that's a it's a box that creates it's basically a virtual sat panel, um, and then some AIO and some MADI connectivity for the truck racks. Um, 
and the field racks would be on the right. So those field racks would all connect via fiber optic. Uh, every one of them has a switch uh, with redundancy going back to the to the uh, to the truck. Um, that was give, give you either uh, a BTR, they give you some analog I/O, they give you uh, mic preamps, all that on site. Uh, you know, whatever your remote location is. Um, awesome. You know. I was just going to say, so it looks like most of this deployment here right now is is mostly PL and comms. Is that accurate? That's is that that's most of the pictures that we see here here are PL and comms. Um, okay. You know, we've we've rolled wireless into it. You know, uh, with Axie Digital having uh, Dante capability, that's made it really really smooth, really slick, and and, and easy to integrate into the uh, you know into the ecosystem, um, which is really really nice. You know. Awesome. So we, we talked about earlier, maybe you um, pulling up your screen and showing us your Dante page. Uh, do we think we can make that happen here and kind of go through sure. how you're routing? Awesome. Let me sure. um, give you control. There you are. Uh, I am going to turn my camera off here just so that the screen gets a little bit larger so we can see this Dante uh, platform. Um, Brian, feel free to leave yours on if you'd like. Um, but yeah, kind of so, just walk us through this massive, massive Dante page you have here. I know so, um, for me, <laughs> it's one of the largest I've seen, if not the largest. But uh, kind of go through how, where do you start, I guess, in, in your planning stages of getting all this organized, um, keeping it organized, getting it routed, and and how you how you stay sane? Sure. So we have a, uh, we run a full static network. Um, we don't, we're, we haven't gotten to the point where we've having to deploy 254 or more devices. Um, so we, we run a full static network. Uh, we have a small pool of DHCP that we run in there. So if somebody does pop onto the network, at least can it grab an address and then we can readdress it to where it's supposed to be. Um, so that's, that's really the first step is designing your, you know, designing your network and getting your IP scheme and, and infrastructure and how you're going to roll that out and what, what layout you want to be in, what your subnetting is all going to be. Um, it's, it takes a little bit of time, but it will certainly save you on the back end. Um, this particular network that I'm running here not only includes audio, uh, includes a lot of Omnio or RTS. So we have a lot of communications devices in here. Uh, we have some mixing consoles in here. Um, on any other given year, I would have some Axiom Digital in here. Um, unfortunately, without the fan base here, the uh, you know doing interviews on site and on the grounds has very limited. Uh, capabilities. So our clients would normally uh, be utilizing some actually digital into the network, uh, as well as some IFBs, uh, potentially some some PFM 1000s or something. Um, so we, it, like I said earlier, meant you know it just fills and comes into the eco you know, the ecosystem that's here. Um, so like at the top, we you know labeling is another thing is 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 crucial and key. You know how do you label everything? I go through. I label everything. I IP it. I label it. I change the name on it. I do all of that before I make any routes because the way that Dante works is Dante works on the name. So if you change the name of a device, its previous route, it may not, uh, it, may, it won't fall over. So the, the other device won't know who it's supposed to talk to. Because unlike a lot of other systems, you know, Dante doesn't have a main server. It doesn't have a main brain. Um, all of the memory is within each Dante device. So it's, it's, the device's responsibility to remember who it talked to last. Um, so if it so if it falls off the network, you'll see. Let's see if I have any here, or if all my connections, my subscriptions are here. So you'll see, like on here, you'll see an orange triangle. It's kind of listed here. I don't know if anybody can see that. It's a little bit difficult, probably because it's small. But you'll see uh, that orange triangle is indicating that it's missing a device. It's looking for a route that doesn't exist. So, like, if I double click on it, it'll open up a secondary window that I can look into, and I can scroll down through over, and I'll say, "Oh, uh, you'll see that device here." Let me blow this up, make it a little bit bigger, easier to see. So you can see that this device here, with the orange triangle, um, is missing a sub subscription unresolved. So it's looking for that device, but that device just happens to not be on our network uh, at this particular moment in time. Um, these are a, this. What you see here is a, is a, a group of radio folks here um, that are utilizing a Dante, a couple Dante consoles. They've got some announcer 
uh, packs in here as well. Um, and they're utilizing to, so we, we send them all the effects and everything that they get to mix all their radio court sounds uh, off the, all the various courts that are here within the grounds. There's 16 broadcast courts here. Wow. Um, you'll see some of these other ones that we, you know, like I said, labeling. So we know that, you know, in, in the world of RTS, which we live in, uh, we know that this is a KP panel and you'll see that there's a, you know, um, the four letter alpha that you're allowed in RTS is there. And then we have a designation as to where it is and, and who's, who utilizes it. Um, down here, I can open up one of these guys. So this particular year, because it's a little bit different than every year, every other year, um, we would normally have one console in a room that we would send effects up to, uh, and the IFBs would be mixed locally for any talent for all the broadcast courts that we have. Uh, we make we currently send out six broadcast courts uh, that have commentators full time, and but this year they all got split up where we had uh, everybody got into their own broadcast rooms to make sure to maintain social distancing. So instead of having multiple people in a broadcast room, each room only had just a play-by-play -play or just a color. Um, and I can show you how one of those consoles would look like uh, by going to our... So this particular console, um, this is the color commentators console. So their color headset uh, you have to choose the way this console is laid out. Your Dante side of it is either use the slot card or you use the analog input, uh, which is on the back of the console. So in this particular console, that, that headset goes in locally um, here via the uh, XLR. And then we put their play-by-play -play, uh, gets married into it with, with a Dante route, which comes out of their console. I take a direct output, I feed it to them. And then we can utilize to make a mix minus and have them talk back and forth. Um, and you'll see their IFBs here. Um, and then we have, we utilize this, you'll see this talk back two that's here, this TB2 on uh, path 24 here. And what that is, that allows, we allow the, the commentators to have an ISO between themselves so they can talk to each other off air um, and give each other pointers and, and stuff like that. Uh, once again, this year is a little bit different than other years. <laughs> Normally these people will be sitting next to each other and either passing notes or talking silently offline. But you know, it's <laughs> the world we live in this particular year. 2020. Uh, 2020. <laughs> yeah. Everything's changing a little um, bit. So, you know, I, I have Maddie devices. Um, so I the way I receive everything is via Maddie, which is here. Um, so I receive everything via Maddie from the distribution point, which they're called, uh, it's called the talk here on site. Um, they'll send me all of the the various uh, uh, court sounds and stuff like that, and then I will um, utilize the Matty to Dante devices to then uh, transmit them into the network and send them to their appropriate places via either unicast or multicast, depending on how uh, you know how my network traffic uh, plays out. You know, I try not to use as much multicast. Uh, or try to use as little as multicast as I can um, because, and the reasoning on this particular network is I have a lot of um, devices. So in the Dante world, you have all the different chipsets. So the mm -hmm. Ultimo chip is the smallest of all the chips and it's only a hundred megabit chip versus some of the bigger chips like the uh, one two, which is a full gigabit chip. Those smaller devices cannot discern the little bit of information uh, that's for them versus the full information that's on the on the network. So if you are running 70, 80, 90 megabits of multicast bandwidth, it's going to be flooding these little devices with information. And they don't know how to discern which little bit, which kilobits of information are theirs versus uh, the rest of the information that just, you know, can go, can go to the other devices that it's intended for. Um, so you'll end up with network problems and those devices won't, won't be able to handle the full traffic. So Dante as a, a in its simplest form is a unicast, uh, it's a unicast by default. So you have to make it multicast if you, if you want to go that route, but I try to it as much as I can. Uh, so I'm not flooding the network with just extraneous traffic that, uh, you know, you don't need. 
Can you walk through that that process where you make that distinction for, for those users that are unaware of that, the multicast and unicast sure. selections? Sure, I can do it down here on one of the consoles that we don't, uh, I'm not utilizing right now. Awesome. Uh, like this particular console um, used to be one of our, our outer courts that we were no longer using. So if we look at it in the in the in this uh, device window here, where you're looking at the receives, the transmits, you can you can look at the status of it. Um, you can check in on your latency of your device if you have any routes. Like right now, I don't have any routes. Let me see if I if I show you this guy here. It'll show you the latencies uh, to make sure that everything is set in time. So let me go back so we can make this. Okay, so. The multicast and unicast is uh, determined in the transmit side of the devices. So right now, it's telling me over here in the little window that I have zero, zero unicast and zero multicast, but I have a total of 32 flows that I can utilize. If you wanna create a multicast, you come up here to the top uh, window, you see this what looks like a Y cord, for those of us in the, the analog days, you click on your little Y cord there, and then you would choose whatever particular ch transmit channel you uh, you would like. So if we wanted to take the play-by-play -play headset, we would check mark that. We could do the color headset, we check mark that, and then we would hit create. Now it shows you over here. So uh, the difference being instead of uh, I think of um, you know a unicast flow is I think of it as like a, like a rifle shot. It's a one for one. Right, it's it's a point to point um, versus a multicast, which is essentially uh, there's a bunch of receivers on the network that want this particular device, but instead of having to, um, you know, fire a shot to every one of those devices, you can do a multicast flow where it's a burst. It's more like a uh, you know equivalent of like a shotgun, where it would be a burst of information that would come out, and then all of the receivers that are on there would pick off the you know this uh, information that they that they particularly want. Um, but once again, if you start flooding all the network with all the extraneous information, it could uh, adversely affect some of the other devices on the network. And if you want to get rid of any of your flows, um, you can get you would just highlight them, and then you would delete them down the bottom down here. Now, if any devices were still connected to one of your multicast flows that you wanted to get rid of, uh, it would prompt you and say, hey, uh, so-and-so is still connected to this. Do you, are you sure you want to take away the multicast flow? Because uh, if you do, there'll be a momentary lapse in, in audio. It could be a little, little burp in the audio. Awesome. I know we get a lot of questions about the unicast and multicast and when and, and what makes sense and why you would use it. And obviously, there's a couple errors that come up uh, about that situation. So it's always nice to get some clarification on on how and when and why that, that uh, workflow is used. Yeah. We so got a I, question. You know, I I, I, Go I, ahead, it is, Brian. It is, Brian useful in certain, it is useful in certain circumstances. I just try to look at uh, you know, how, much, how much you want to utilize. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a tool in the box. Uh, yep. We got a question in here um, from Aza, and the question is, can you talk about your naming conventions more? What is Y000? So this actually is the default of the Y00 is the default of the Yamaha console that's up there. So since I know that they're all Yamaha consoles, I, I left them with the Y00. So that way I do, because uh, the way it displays in the Dante here is in alphabetical order. So if I left it that way, I knew that all of them would, uh, you know, would be in one big grouping. Awesome. And then what's the CT one Ash? Obviously, we know color, and I know that I know what Ash is, but some people here may not. <laughs> sure. So, uh, so we, like I said, we have uh, the, the five main courts here. Really, uh, on a normal year, this one's a little bit different. You would normally have uh, Arthur Ashe as our largest stadium uh, court one. Court two is Louis Armstrong Stadium. That's our second largest. We would normally have the grandstand court. Um, this year we didn't have the grandstand court because they're util they utilized it for a tournament actually right before the US Open. So it wouldn't have been ready. And they also had, didn't have as many players as we normally would have this year. So we didn't utilize that. But that would normally be court three uh, or the grandstand court. Uh, and then you have court 17 and court five are the next in terms of size and order. So those would typically be the flex, you see the flex four and the flex five there. 
Um, the way this broadcast works is we have commentators that are that are assigned to those uh, specific courts. So yeah, the, where you see Ash color, Ash play by play, the only court that they will ever cover is anything that happens on the Arthur, Arthur Ashe Stadium. Uh, the Flex Four and the Flex Five courts, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's 16 total broadcast courts here. They will not cover any of the large three courts, so Ash, Armstrong, and the Grandstand Court on a normal year, um, but they have the ability to cover any one of the other courts that are out there. That's just why we call them the Flex Courts, because they have the ability to go to any one of the other courts uh, on site. Awesome. Um, cool. Thank you for, for showing us that. Um, it's, that's pretty impressive. Um, I do, I do have kind of an interesting question here for you and, and how long have you been doing the U S open now? This is year 19. <laughs> and how many years have you had a full Dante backbone? Uh, this will be the sixth, six year. Cool. So, so I guess, and, and Kirk, I know you're here in the background, our other guest, you, you can jump in here and as well. I know we're going to talk, this might get a little more general, um, but like what, what was your workflow prior to Dante for this gig or, or really any gig that you had Kirk and, and what about this system is making it simpler, easier, more efficient? What do you like about it? What do you miss about it? How's your setup time changed? Um, what are you, what are you gaining out of using Dante versus uh, I guess how your, how your installations were prior to this networked audio world? Or what were you using before that was networked audio? For me here, everything used to be analog. Um, so we used to have to patch into some DAs that were either in the house or we had to create some DAs down here and utilize some analog tie lines into the building. Um, it, was, it was quite the undertaking to have to, <laughs> to get around and move a signal around this building without having to go through a hum or a buzz or a hiss. Um, so by taking all that out of play, and just utilizing the fiber optic connectivity we had upstairs and, and putting a switch in line. Um, we had there's Cat5 in every room, so we were able to just patch uh, the Cat5 tie lines into every room, bring everything down on our, on our network, um, and able to talk and make changes in real time uh, much, much faster than on previous years. In, in analog, there was many points of failure. I'd plug in one place, but have to go to two other places to double check to make sure that it was working. In previous years, but now it's just I have a straight path right upstairs. Awesome. So, Kirk, let's talk about a little bit about what you're what you're doing with Dante. I know last time it was kind of a the stadium installation situation that we had spoke about. Right. Um, so, I guess let's bring you in a little bit here. Obviously, obviously, Brian, you're you're in quite a few stadiums, but Kirk, what where are you using Dante recently? And and I guess give us the the brief as to why and what benefits you're seeing from from this. Well, also it's a very similar situation to Brian. Uh, I use it. Super Bowl is my big gig every year, and we have tons of nodes and tons and tons of hundreds of channels of audio we're moving around the stadium to various locations and everything. And running a piece of fiber or a couple of pieces of fiber is so much easier than running huge multi-pair analog cable. And and Brian was saying. You have so many points of failure, not that you don't with a network, but you have so many points of failure with analog. You got induced noise, you've got shorts, you've got all kinds of stuff uh, happening. And some of that can happen with a network as well, but not. it's a little bit easier to deal with because you can build a layer of redundancy in with a network that you can't with analog. I mean, you're not gonna run 18, 56 pairs when you only need nine. It's, that's, tons of cable, it's expensive and everything, but it's real easy to run four fibers instead of two. Um, it's like running XLR cable. I mean, it's easy and it's, and fiber can handle thousands of audio channels. Uh, and so pretty much most projects, we use a little bit of Dante on. We use it primarily for the drive side of our system. That's console to amplifier uh, aspect and everything. The input side's a little more complicated for using the Yamaha consoles as Brian is. You know, the, Rio, the CL series, the Rios and the CL1s and 5s are all Dante compatible and they use that to communicate between the IO boxes, the Rio boxes and the console. So you're already there with that and that makes it a lot easier. Um, so there's a, we use quite a bit of Dante. Uh, 
permanent install. I, I cross the bridge a lot. I work a lot of shows, but yet at the same time, I do a lot of permanent install. I've been working on SoFi Stadium for uh, helping commission it for the last five months. Uh, and that is the biggest Dante system I've ever seen. Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, there is so much. And you spread it out over a stadium. And they're also running it on uh, a converged enterprise network, which adds a whole another level of complexity to it. Uh, personally, I prefer to run my own network because I'm in control of my destiny. I nobody, I don't have to try to explain to an IT guy and speak his language and tell him that no, you need to open up these ports or you need to open up these broadcast addresses. And uh, Brian, you were touched, talking a little bit about multicast versus unicast, and we do one thing different, and, and I don't know if you're doing this, but we do multicast filtering in our switches. We have more advanced Cisco switches we use, which allows us to not worry about those 100 meg devices, because for instance, our amplifiers are on the same network uh, as our Dante devices, because we all want, we want to be able to see everything with one network. And all of our amplifiers are 100 base T. So we use multicast filtering in the switches that, uh, that will filter out all the non-essential broadcasts or multicast packets from a device. So if that vi device is not subscribed to that multicast packet, it will drop it before it sends it to the device and drop it at the network port as opposed to flooding the device itself. And, th and that's one way to work around it. But now, I've just added a whole huge level of complexity to my network by doing that. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's something you control outside of Dante, correct? You're talking correct. about that's, that's in the switch yeah. itself. That is not that has nothing to do with Dante. Dante really doesn't even know about it. Uh, but that's where you have to start. And Ryan, you hit on this a little bit earlier about you have to decide what your needs are. How many nodes? If it's a two node system, you're going from a real box on the stage to your console. Great. Run a piece of cat six. You're done. You don't need a network switch. You don't need anything. Okay, maybe you have two real boxes. Now you got to loop one to the other side of the stage and back. Okay, that's still fine. But now all of a sudden you've got 15 locations around the US Open, multiple courts, everything, Super Bowl for me, outside, inside the stadium, trucks, everywhere. Now I have to build a full-blown network. And that's where you have to become an IT guy. And then you got to talk about multicast versus unicast. Unicast is awesome if you can get away with it. Unfortunately, I can't. I've got 30 people who want to receive the same flow, and I can't send that flow unicast 30 times. Dante Controller does not like that. So I will multicast. What is, what is the max for unicast? They, they start flashing an error at you at three. Okay. Hey, maybe if you want to consider a multicast flow, you can get away with it. I've done as many as five, which it really doesn't like but I got away with it. Uh, but that was also back in the day when the technology was more expensive. I mean, I've been running Dante for about as long as Brian has, about six years, but I haven't done a full-blown Dante system. I used to run it in multiple networks at Super Bowl. Now I have one network that I run it all together with. I've been doing that for, this, uh, for about three years. And what, I, what we did with the Thank God we we rely upon the IT world because they sink a lot of money into their world and we reap the benefits a lot of times. Uh, for instance, 10 gig transceivers, you can find them for $15 now, a transceiver. They used to be $1,500 a transceiver a couple of years ago. Now they're $15, it's like, great. So I run 10 gig backbone between all my big hubs and then branch off of that at one gig. So now my now I don't have to worry about bottlenecks on my truck ports all around my network. Those are things you have to think about as you're designing your network and, and starting up your system. Who needs to receive what? How much multicast? At, for instance, at Super Bowl, my multicast last year was 750 megabytes, which I saw yours was 26, Brian, on, on Dante Controller. You showed me that, that. I was chuckling at that because I wish I could get away with that. But yeah, I'm, I was 50 something the other day, but as courts go away, I've been able to right. take some of that traffic out. <laughs> right. And, and as you said, you know, if you're not using the multicast filtering in the switch, then you really have to worry about that. And that, that's why we sat down and uh, Scott Harmel and I, we decided that we're going to 
implement the multicast bra uh, the multicast filtering in the switches and, and that just really helped us out and everything and we have all our switches set up standard so it doesn't matter which switch you grab off the shelf or anything it's they're all set up they're all ready to go but it took time because not all manufacturers tell you which which broadcast ports they need open uh, we had to wire shark some stuff we were having some control issues with several things and uh, but we figured it out and we we've learned a pretty stable system uh, real quick, Kirk, what's what's Wireshark? Wireshark is an analyzing tool that will read all your data coming in from your network. So you can sit there and you can see what's getting dropped, what's trying to go out that's not making it through. Uh, it works best if you have a hub. Good luck on finding a network hub today. Uh, we have some old, we have a couple old ones that we kept just because of Wireshark. Uh, I don't, okay, now I guess I should explain the difference between a hub and a switch. Uh, a switch is a point to point, a hub is whatever comes in goes out all ports of the switch. Uh, sorry, old school here. I actually remember all that technology. Uh, so hubs are, I've not seen a hub for sale except on eBay for years, uh, but that helps because then you can see everything coming in and out uh, from all the devices. Uh, so Wireshark is just a way to really analyze what's going on. And it's uh, it's overwhelming when you first look at it because it's just tons and tons of data, tons and tons of network packets you're seeing and you're going, okay, I, I really want to filter on this specific uh, protocol or IP address or whatever. So you have to really play the game a lot and, and everything. So it took some time, but we figured out how to get the multicast filtering working really well on the switches and not turning off the control for the Yamaha consoles or the monitoring on the Axiom microphones and things like that. Because that's what happens is those ports get turned off and because they're sending data on specific broadcast addresses on the network. And if, you've, if those are not allowed to flow through the switch, then obviously that data doesn't make it. So you're sitting there scratching your head going, why am I not seeing the, uh, the meters on these Axiom's? Um, and wireless workbench, and then you have to kind of backtrack and start troubleshooting and figure out which switch is not configured right. Um, so, but it's it's it all starts with the network. Uh, you've got to understand what you're doing and what what your need is for that particular event, and then you carry it forward from there. Sorry, awesome. I rambled a bit. No, that was fantastic. That was great, Brian. You looked like you were going to have something to add there. No, I just, I totally agree. You know, it's getting that initial backbone of the network, like you said, you know, running that 10 gig backbone, you know, and then branching off into the smaller stuff allows you to take all that traffic and gives you plenty of highway to push all that traffic through. Um, you know, it's the IT world is a whole nother animal. <laughs> um, and there's a lot to learn there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm no expert by any means, but uh, every day I seem to learn something new. Yeah, there's a, a question that just came through from Michael, and it says, you've talked about becoming an IT tech. Did you end up learning that on your own? Did you take basic IT network classes to get you better in place to set up and deploy systems? What would you recommend uh, resource-wise for somebody who's looking to, to brush up their chops a little bit on, on basic networking and IT skills? Yes, all of it. Uh, <laughs> there are some really good basic introduction classes online uh, for free. There's a lot of online resources. Uh, that's where I get a lot of my information. I still do it to this day. I mean, I, as Brian says, we're audio guys. We're, we're not IT guys, but we've had to become IT guys over the years, especially in the permanent install world where I'm having to tell a real IT guy, no, 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 I need this filtering in. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And they're scratching their head going, no, why? And you have to explain it to them and everything. So. There's a lot of great online classes, uh, a lot of great material, but it's a self-learned thing. I mean, you have to make the effort to do it. There's very few people that I know. I know it's that way at my company. There, there's not a. We're going to teach you how to teach you how IP addressing works and how sub masking works. There's we don't have any of that. You have to learn all that on your own. And like I said, I learned it under fire. I learned it uh, on a theme park with CobraNet. Uh, I was working oh, yeah. with Kevin Gross, who actually wrote CobraNet, and we were trying to get it working in a theme park where everything in the theme park was on CobraNet, and we had hundreds of VLANs 
And because CobraNet is limited to 64 channels total, doesn't matter which direction, it's 64 channels total on a 100 base T network. And back then in the late 90s, early 2000s, that was it. There wasn't gigabit. There wasn't a lot of the great technology. There was 10 gigabit was a pipe dream. Uh, so I learned under fire. I mean, I'm literally sitting down with the IT guys going, okay, explain this to me. And I had the luxury of having those guys at my disposal to be able to call and say, hey, I'm not understanding this. I, I feel like an idiot. And they're like, no, 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 this works this way. Subnet masking was so hard for me to get my head wrapped around until I learned binary. And when I started learning binary, I went, oh, oh, okay, now it makes sense. But if you don't understand that and you don't figure that out, it, you always struggle with it. So it's really, you really have to focus on it yourself and you have to put the time and effort into it. You don't need to take Cisco classes and become a CCNE, CCNA, sorry, of uh, certified and everything, because that's not necessary. But learning the basics of a networking, IP addressing, broadcast, uh, all those types of things are very important now, especially with Dante. If you get into Dante Domain Manager, you really need to know about the clocking and uh, the network clocking and all that stuff because now you've opened up a whole nother world. And also, uh, Brian, I don't know if you have the issue too, but when you're interfacing with other people, you've got to deal with the clock. You know, and I, my, like Super Bowl for me, we do everything in the stadium. It's not just the halftime show or the pregame show and we're done. We, we're mixing the PA in the bowl. We're supplying channels to radios and TV networks and all kinds of people. So when production's done after halftime show, they're turning their truck off and they're starting to load out. If I clock to them, I'm hosed at that point. So, and then uh, the, re the reverse is at the end of the game, when we're done, if the network that, that is there, whether it's CBS, Fox, uh, ESPN, whoever, uh, if they're not done, which they're not, and they're clocking to me and I shut down, then they're hosed. So you have to learn how to break the clock between everything is, yeah, big systems get real complicated. How are you dealing with that there, Brian? Yeah, P2P is typically, is, is, is always a question. <laughs> you know, who's, who wants to be in control? You know, because then if something fails, who, who wants to take the responsibility and say, yeah, that was me? You know, <laughs> nobody wants that responsibility either. Um, so yeah, clocking is always, is always a, an interesting question. As like you said, it, when you're working on these converged networks, you know, um, I typically, I try as best I can <laughs> to run an independent network. Uh, and then I control it, much like you said, Kirk. Um, you know, but there are times you do run on converged networks, and having that ability to be able to, you know, talk to the IT guy and say, "Hey, I need QoS on this. I need that. You know, I need the multicast on here. You know, you got to be able to give this a top priority." And then, and, you know, and those basic skills of getting through it, if you, if you know how, if you can get those out to the IT guys, they'll be able to filter from there and really dive into the switches and handle it. You know, because like you said, that's not really our deals to get that deep into the switches. But at least if you can convey to them the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing or making sure that PTP passes through, you know, um, you know, a lot of times I, I like to run a master clock in my network. Um, I don't like to I try as best I can to not have another device uh, be the master clock. Like if it's already if that device is already doing a lot of other things, you know, if it's a MADI device, it's an analog device, it's already handling all this traffic in and out. So why not just have a device? It's only, its sole purpose is to create PTP and push it out to the network. Um, and there's a couple, you know, one that we use a, a product, Studio Technologies makes a box uh, that we use a lot of, it's a 5401. Um, you know, so it's, like I said, those other devices are already, are already taxed and doing a lot of other things. So, why not just have one thing and its sole purpose is to be a master clock? Yeah, that was that was definitely on the list of things to talk about. Was was how are you determining your master clock and what outboard gear do you you tend to? Are you using an outboard clock for a master? Or are you using a device that has a built-in clock? What's your what's your list of of how you determine that? Uh, I mean, that's all really going to be based upon you know what's what's available to you. Um, what's your connectivity like if 
you know, I work a lot in the sports world where we were, you know, that will be a booth kit. So you're coming down from the truck, you know, and, and, and you'll have a truck side. So uh, am I interfacing via Matty? Am I interfacing via analog? Um, you know, what device do you want to, you know, do you want the, the Matty box? Because your Matty will have, will have clock on it. So you, that can clock your network there. Um, but if you have the ability to have a separate independent clock, like I said, just to run that, and that its sole purpose on the entire network is just to be the clock, uh, that Absolutely. would definitely be the preference. Okay. Kirk, advanced thoughts on clocking? Uh, I let Dante handle that normally. Okay. Uh, and, it, and it does bounce between different devices and stuff, and, and I'm okay with that as long as it's um, it stays within itself. For me, I keep my network to myself. I My end devices, whether it's Matty, AES, analog, that's where my clock breaks is when I go into other people. Like uh, I don't run Dante into a TV truck. I will do a Matty bridge with sample rate converters on the Matty. Okay. Uh, so that allows me to keep my clock and my clock isolated, and I don't have to worry about uh, anybody powering down or anything. And that, that's how I avoided the problems with the halftime truck, the production truck shuts down after halftime. Uh, and when I shut down uh, before Fox is done, I they I stay completely isolated from them. It's a it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but Maddie is high bandwidth, lots of channels, so it doesn't take many devices to make that transition over. So that I just I try to keep it all. I feel stingy. It's like no, this is my world, my world. You can have this and oh, you protect your work a bit, right? And I feel but like that's it. That's the difference. Is that we're doing live stuff. Just, Brian and I are both doing live television. There's no whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Let's retry that. No, it, it's a one-shot deal. I mean, halftime is 12 minutes. 12 minutes. It's four minutes to get everything on, 12 minutes show, four minutes to get everything off. That's it. I mean, there is no stop and redo. There's no start over. There's, and unfortunately, we saw what happened uh, last year's Thanksgiving Day game, um, unfortunately, when they lost power on the field. Uh, and that's my nightmare. I mean, right. Anything that can take my network down and prevent us from having a show, I try very hard to make sure that it's not there. Single points of failure, bad. Uh, speaking of redundancy and everything, Brian, uh -huh. Brian, do you guys do you run a full <laughs> redundant system? Sorry, I kind of stepped on you there, Jason. No, that I, it's next on the list. You, it's segueing perfectly, actually. So I was just agreeing. Yeah, primary, secondary was kind of the next thing that we were going to dive into. So that was a, a perfect segue. Fire away. Um, you know, a lot of that I, I would love to on every show. Um, you know, a lot of that depends on budget, you know, and clientele. Um, you know, does the client have the budget to be able to create a fully redundant network? You know, um, it's <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, you know, some places they, they, they said single points of failure. You know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, if, if a fiber goes down and you have to rechange a piece of fiber, you know, the, the network will recover. But if that switch, one of your core switches goes down, you know, with the amount of processing that a lot of these switches do, it can take you 20 minutes to recover. And like you said, in a tw Super Bowl halftime show where it's a 12 minute show and you got 20 minutes to recover, it just doesn't get, it just doesn't fly, you know. Um, so in those aspects, you have to you have to protect your network and protect as best you can. Like you said, you know, uh, UPSs, whatever, whatever redundant networks, whatever it requires, um, you know, in that type of a show, there's to me personally there's no question like you would have to do that you know on other shows where it's smaller where clients don't have the budgets they may not be willing to pay for it you know um so that's just it's just a, t a chance to take but you know we're like you mentioned earlier kurt you know we're, we're taking advantage of the amount of time that cisco that netgear that ubiquity all these guys have taken and put into their switches and you know the the, the world revolves around switching now the banking industry you know if switches in the banking industry go down like the economy crashes. So they, they've tried to bulletproof these things as best they can. And all we're doing is throwing some kilobits of audio down the line and, you know, and it's, and it's working. <laughs> um, but we're, we're able to take advantage of all the R&D that these guys have already done. <laughs> it's kind of nice, you know, actually. Billions of dollars they've spent yeah. on developing this and we're reaping the benefits of it. Uh, but at the same time, we have to play along in their game. And that's where it kind of gets difficult because sometimes our needs are a little different than what they see as their need. 
Uh, so that's where it kind of gets interesting, especially for people like Shore uh, or Audnate. A lot of those people are having to figure out how to work around the standards that the, the IT industry has set. And, and that's great. I mean, it's it makes it easier for us to do our shows and everything. For me, redundancy is no question. I have dual switches. I have dual devices. I use primary and secondary on every device. I, I rarely use a single network device. Uh, everything I have is redundant. I run redundant fiber. I mean, I everything is different. And there's there's within reason. There's all you know. Sometimes you have to take the same exact path. Uh, fiber. So if one gets cut, so the chances are the other one is too. Then you're kind of you can't really do much about that. Uh, so for me, it's always fully redundant, and it's just the the price to play. You know, if you're going to do the live shows, it doesn't matter if it's the Oscars or the Emmys or the Super Bowl or whatever. They're all live, and there's no stop. There's no redo. There's you have to protect yourself at all cost. Uh, in the theme park world, it was 20 minutes. If a ride goes down, you got 20 minutes to get it back up. I laugh at that now because I, at that time I thought, <laughs> man, that's crazy. But nowadays I go, I'd love to have 20 minutes. Oh my yeah. gosh, I have seconds to get things up and running. Uh, it was for me, my first Super Bowl was San Diego 2002, 2003. Um, and I remember we had, there was a, we were using a, a QSC Raves as the IO device. I noticed you're using focus rights like we do, Brian, now with Dante, which is, they're great devices. But back then it was QSC Raves. And uh, and there was a, Very they had familiar a. familiar with those too. Okay, there was a buddy link that went between them. So you had a true master and a slave device. Uh, with relays and everything. So if the master dropped off and that buddy link started, the master would open up his relays because that was default. And then the slave would close his device and you wouldn't hear a difference. It was just, it was so fast and perfect. And I wish that there was that device in Dante, but there's really not right now. Uh, but we got into a situation where the power supply, where it co the connector that it connected to the processing board, the, the connector corroded on one of my devices. And I got this ping pong effect during the halftime show where uh, where the, the master would go down and open up his relays, the, the slave would catch in and then the master would come back online. And when the master comes back online, it's about a 10 second, 15 second pause as this network uh, tries to figure out what's going on. Oh, this device came back. Oh, okay, here's your subscriptions you were getting, go. Uh, and then it would turn off again and bounce back and you wouldn't hear that, but they would turn back on. So I got this ping pong effect where the audio was dropping and I got a phone. I, I took, I knew exactly what was going on. I took off, I ran, I had to actually dive into the stands with security chasing me and unplug the device <laughs> because I had to get over the rail to get to the back of the device. And I got it unplugged and then the secondary device took over and everything was fine. We finished the show, but it was about 30 seconds of this ping pong, about, well, it was about 60 seconds of this ping pong bouncing back and forth. And people, my radio was lighting up and everything. And I vowed at that point, I would never put myself in that situation again. Um, and so that's why I am so scared and so focused on redundancy. I don't want to fail. I don't want it to fail. I, I want to be able to move devices and do everything I possibly can automatically so that if anything happens, a fiber gets cut, a device power supply lets go, whatever, I don't have to think about it in the pressure of that 12 minutes or in any point in the day. I mean, that whole day is just, I'm pacing all day because uh, you just don't know what's going on. And, and that's my, that's how I go to sleep at night is knowing that, okay, we're covered of what could happen. And that's why primary and secondary is redundant, is very important for me. A question just came through related to this. What what are your test methods for making sure your redundancy is redundant? Set it up in the shop and start unplugging things. Start unplugging and, stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try it. I mean, practice makes perfect. Uh, the cool thing is that you know, Super Bowl is once a year and we know early on if we're doing it or not. So we have time to build in the shop and 
And it's a it's actually a good time of the year because it's before all the, the smaller TV shows go into production and everything. So we have a lot of equipment in the shop and there's not a ton going on. So we can build things and sit there and bang on it for a couple of weeks and then pack it up and put it on the truck. We'll see if that's the case come February, huh? I, yeah, I have no <laughs> idea what's going to happen this year. I hope we even make it through the season. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Awesome. This has been fantastic, uh, you guys. We're, we're a couple of minutes up here to the hour. We have quite a few questions that came in from the, uh, the attendees. Do you mind if we dive into some of those and, and see where Please. they take us? Awesome. Uh, so uh, earlier on, uh, the question came through from, uh, excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, Edgelito says, what is the make and model of the network switches you're using or recommend? For us, we use the Cisco uh, SG350 series switches. Uh, they're small, 10 ports, fully managed. Uh, they're not that expensive. They're less than $200 a switch. You don't need, uh, some devices need PoE, uh, it's power over ethernet uh, yep. to power up with. Uh, we don't have very many of those devices at all. We have a few, but it's very few and far between. So we, most of our switches are not PoE, so that keep the price down. Uh, but the the Cisco's or what we do, the 300 series are what we use. We have, actually use some 500s too. We get into some core switches that are just fiber switches. They don't have any network ports on. They're just all fiber ports. Uh, I, I tend to run more of a star topology than a ring, uh, just because. And if I lose, I'm only losing one spy, one sphere of the uh, star. I'm not losing a section of the ring. Uh, so it's the way we decided to do our network. Brian? I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> That's exactly how I do it. Uh, I have SG300s, okay. SG350s, SG500s, uh, all Cisco's. Um, and I do the same thing. I run it as a star. So that way, if you're only losing one at one round, one piece of edge, of an edge device versus you're losing a whole grouping of edge devices. Perfect. Sa save yourself a little bit of a little bit of hassle there. Okay. Well, Cisco um, owns most of the market. I mean, I think that last time I checked, it's like Cisco has 60% of the world's network switching uh, market. So they kind of drive it, and it yeah. made sense to be with them. Not an accident, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it is one of it is one of Autonate's. Uh, recommended switches, you know, the Cisco with the SG series, they pretty close to out of the box. You can you can let them run just as they are. Uh, there's a couple few minor tweaks where you got to look in the uh, energy efficiency. Got to make sure that's turned off. That's one of the big ones because uh, that'll start clamping down your ports as the ports become uh, little traffic. Um, other than that, they really out of the box without too much configuration. They 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 work. Somewhat plug and play. Getting there. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so Chidana asks, uh, how do you start plotting your routing for a show of this size? Are you using a separate spreadsheet? Um, where do you begin with that? And even maybe your topology that you just talked about in terms of ring or star. And how do you how do you begin the planning phases of all your endpoints, um, your routing and your naming? Uh, I mean, I start with, you know, the, the, the coverage calls and everything prior to the events. We, we, we have CAD drawings of all the layouts of where everything's going to go so we can start figuring out where all the switches are going to fall into place. You know, we also try to limit the amount of switches as we can because uh, in this world, you know, the more you add in, the more latency, the more processing you have. So in the live audio, you know, now we have to match video. So you got to take all that into account as well. Um, or in live sound, you know, you have people's ears, the more switches you throw in, you throw in a delay in their ears. Now those problems. Um, so that all, that all comes into account. You know, I have, I run a, some sort of a spreadsheet, either a Google Doc or something where I start laying out how the consoles are going to be laid out. Like on this particular event, how the consoles are going to be laid out, how the people are going to do, uh, you know, how they need to talk to each other. I, I start putting the list together of all the things and then trying to figure out how I can make that all work within what devices or what devices I'll need on top of what I already, already have. Awesome. That's kind of where I start. I agree. It starts with the uh, pre-production, talking to everybody about their needs. Uh, uh, for me, uh, again, I'm sorry I keep focusing on Super Bowl because it is the biggest and most challenging event that I do. Uh, and a lot of times we don't. There, there have been several years that we didn't find out the artist till mid-December, and that affects your channel count greatly. 
So, yeah. you know, I'm having to go, okay, so I got a, I got a template that I start with that I've had for a year and it didn't matter if it was analog or Cobranet. I use kind of the same template. It's kind of developed over the years. Uh, now other shows are usually smaller and it's usually just the drive side. So it's really easy to kind of say, okay, I got a left, I got a right, I got some delays. I've got, you know, is it, whether it's a left and right delay or just a mono delay, two sets of delays, one set of delays, side fills, whatever. Um, I can, I, it, they're pretty easy to knock out um, uh, kind of running, but on the big shows, you have to really start laying it out. And I, t and I start with a segment at a time and it doesn't really matter which segment, you got to start somewhere. You just pick and say, okay, I'm going, what, what do I need to interface with the broadcast truck? What do I need to interface with the production truck? What do I need to interface with the radio feed, uh, you know, and all that type of stuff. So it's just laying out each segment as I go along and build it up and then hand it to my guys and say, okay, here it is, make this work. If you have any questions, ask. Wicked. Um, cool. So uh, another question here from Asa says, how many people do you allow access to Dante Controller and are you using DDM to restrict access? Uh, uh, I try to limit it to, you know, <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's egotistical or, you know, uh, no, I, 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 you know, you really have to, you got to trust the people that are going to be in your network. Um, whomever part of, whomever is part of your team, you know, you really should keep that, that to a minimum. Um, you know, I don't personally use DDM just because of the, the nature of my stuff. I try to be my own network. I try not, I try not to cross over into too many as I can. Um, or we put some sort of, you know, edge device in between for the clocking or any of that other kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not as familiar with DDM as I am, uh, you know, with, with the, the way that other network is done. But I, I definitely try to limit the amount of people uh, within the network. Uh, I let two people, and I'm not one of them. Um, I, if I need something done, I walk up and say, hey, can you pass this over to here? Because, I mean, that's how strict I am about it is that, you know, these two guys, and it's a little bit of a backup in case one of them gets sick or something, the other one can handle it, but there's so much patching to going on. It's really nice to have two people running in tandem so they can kind of take over different parts of it. Um, and, and then they work together and they kind of draw their own boundaries. Like, okay, I'll be responsible for this over here. You'd be responsible for that and stuff. So we, it's worked really well for us. Uh, I remember the A2s are like, well, we want to jump on and be able to control the focus right units. And I said, nope. I, I, you're not even running the RedNet software on the network. Sorry, if you need that, then you got to go over here and talk to this guy. I, I, that's how strict yep. I am. I mean, yeah. it, the device has got a knob on the front of it. Turn the knob. Um, and it wasn't meant to be a jerk, but it's just like the more people I have on that network doing more things, the more risk there is. And Absolutely. so if I say, you two guys, that's it, and everybody abides by it, then we're good to go. Uh, don't lock it out. It's my network. There should be nobody else on it unless uh, you've brought up. That's that's another conundrum. You got all these network switches spread out all over the place, and there's not a security guy standing right next to it saying, yeah. "Oh, who are you?" Plug, I mean, my, plug my laptop in and open open yeah, Dante. Right? It doesn't have internet access, so you're not going to be doing that. Right. Uh, so it's it's a risk you have to take, and I try to keep the racks located somewhere where they're difficult to get to. There'd be limited access anyways and that type of stuff. Uh, definitely no general public access, but yeah. you know, yeah. just it's a risk. And if somebody, if somebody were to do something, this is what always gets brought up to me in the redundant network. If somebody were to take a cable and plug it between the two network switches, the primary and the secondary network, your host takes your entire network out. And yeah. everybody's going, well, how do you prevent that? And it's like, you know what? I'm going to trust humans to be humans and be nice and not do that. I mean, we're all trying to get the same show done. I mean, that that's a really malice thing to do. So, and I, and I can't focus on that. It, it, that would drive me nuts. Uh, so, you know, I limit the people who are running the software and doing the patching. Yeah. Pe people don't realize the power of one bad IP address. Too. You know, you have <laughs> one, you have one, one duplicate IP address and it will crash. And crash hard. It might not crash right away, but eventually it's going to catch up to you. Awesome, fun stuff. Yeah, I've had the I've had the primary to secondary uh, link take place. It was unintentional. 
it was at a secondary endpoint, but you find out real quick what happens to that network when you, when or, you cross those two over. Yeah, or yeah. somebody just accidentally patches them in wrong. Yeah, that's what you know, it was. It, yeah, that's it, what it was. Not necessarily a loop, but just Correct. literally patching something in wrong. And yep. yeah, if, it, it's hard to troubleshoot. And that's the other thing that we haven't really talked about is how do you troubleshoot one of these networks? It's not like an analog cable that you've got one end and the other end. And it's like, okay, the cable goes from here to here. It's got to be between here and here. It's right. a virtual thing, and it's a different way of thinking. It's a different, as Brian said, you know, you're not carrying a cue box. You're now carrying a laptop and a four-port switch. You, how do you troubleshoot something that's virtual, something that is not real, that you've got so much going on and everything, and one mispatch, one misconfigured port on the switch will take a device out. There's so many things that can go wrong. And it, it's when it's your own network, it's not as bad. It's, it's worse when you're on a converged network and somebody else is in control of the network. And this device was working yesterday. What happened? You know, so you, you might you might not find out right away or you may not nope. be able to troubleshoot it right away. It could take hours to find, you know, because you have to start eliminating. All right, well, if we take these edge devices off, what happens to the network? OK, we'll put them back on. Take these edge now, you know, and start eliminating you know, what, what's going on and where it could be coming from. It, it could take a significant period of time. Long are the days of carrying just a cue box, as you mentioned earlier, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, question came in from Scott, uh, and this is kind of a specific situation, but he says, I had a redundant network where the primary link to front of house was reduced to 100 megabytes per second. Dante kept dropping packets instead of switching to the secondary. Is there a method of setting up redundant network to avoid that kind of failure? Any ideas on this one? Well, if it were me and I saw a compromised link, I'd pull the link. Because uh, obviously you have a cable problem. Uh, you either right. got to replace the okay. cable. And in the middle of a show, that's not always uh, doable. Uh, I, I, if it was in the middle of a show and I saw something going on like that, I would unplug the cable, unplug that primary cable and then make it fail over to the, the secondary, to secondary. Right. And, and hope that I don't need to go anywhere else after that. Uh, I would, I'd actually start, uh, that, that to me just sounds like a cable problem. Um, so I don't know if I would, if I started seeing other things happening with the switch, like weird lights flashing or something, then I'd move to my secondary device. But, um, if everything is working fine on the secondary, I'd, I'd take a deep breath and move on. Uh, but that's, I'd unplug the cable. That's the simplest solution. And I don't know of an automatic way to do that. You might be able to do that in Dante Domain Manager, but I don't think you could do that with control. Do you know, do you know if you can, Brian? Not off the top of my head. Yeah. I don't know of a way to control. DDM might do it. Awesome. Anything to add on that uh, perplexed situation there, Brian? No, I mean, that's, yeah, I'd agree. That, that leads to so what sounds like a cable issue. Um, so that's that's certainly the first place to start. And if you know your secondary network is good and, and up and running, you know, there's, there's no reason not to pull it. Yeah. Scott chimed in, says, you just described exactly what happened. So nice, nice analysis. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, Scott. That's awesome. Um, uh, it, it's good to check yourself. I mean, uh, the last uh, web seminar I was on, it was really nice because uh, there's a lot of things that were happening because we work in a vacuum a lot of times in our own little world and we don't really talk to people outside our world a lot. So it's nice to like talk with Brian. Now we, we do things almost exactly the same. It makes me, it just reconfirms that we're on the right path. So I totally get wanting the feedback and saying, did I do it right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wicked. Shane asks, uh, do you recommend sharing your Dante audio network with NDI video network or should we keep them separate? I think we've kind of covered this, but uh, fire away. You can keep them uh, on the same VLAN. No, I, I would not share. Uh, I would have at least another VLAN hoping that your trunk ports are bigger, that you're not limiting yourself. If it's a one gig trunk port, absolutely not. Uh, if it's a 10 gig trunk port, sure, you got bandwidth there. You can share with video, but they have to be on a separate VLAN. You don't want the traffic seeing each other. I agree. Awesome. 
Let's see. Um, one more in here from Richard. Uh, so we, we talked about redundancy a bit, and that's where his question began, and I think we covered the primary secondary situation. His question ends with, what are you doing for power backups um, for that situation? And obviously, you've got multiple power inputs to two switches and multiple devices for primary and secondary, but do you have, what are you doing outside of that for, for you know, your power failure? Well, the Focusrite devices have two power supplies. Uh, for me, uh, our racks have a UPS on one power port, and then the other power port goes straight to shore power. Uh, you know, usually for us on TV, the TV shows, the utilities are dropping power where we need it, so we only have one circuit most of the time. Uh, so if that circuit fails, yeah, that's bad. Uh, but the UPS should be able to get you by, because it'll start beeping, and you'll know when it goes off. Uh, it's annoying. So that I, I we separate we have one go one bypass in the UPS and one going to the UPS is the way that uh, we do it because UPS has failed too. Just had it happen here. <laughs> oh yeah. Did it, yeah. Did it explode or just it. stop working? No, it just stopped working and we lost the uh, audio video. It was it was our main distribution point. It wasn't us. It was what was fe what feeds up. So yeah, it was, uh, know all about it. <laughs> Fun. But uh, otherwise, I agree. Yeah, there's, I, I agree with what you said. Wicked. Well, the, the well, SG300s only have one power supply, so I would put one of them on UPS and the other one on shore power. So that's just that, that's the only device that doesn't have a, a redundant power supply in the device itself. So you just use it that way. So if the if the UPS dies, you still got the one going to shore power, and it'll everything will kick over to it. Right. Wicked. Awesome, gentlemen. That uh, that is the end of our um, our attendee questions. Um, we always finish these sure webinars being a sure webinar with uh, kind of a final question, and that question is, uh, Kirk, you answered this previously, but w what is your favorite sure product and why? <laughs> go ahead, Brian. You want me to go? Sure. Uh, I think the, actually digital is a game changer. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, I saw it very early on in the process and fell in love with it right away. And every client I've ever sent it out to uh, has requested it back. And, and it takes a little bit to understand how powerful the system is. But once you get into realize how, how versatile and powerful it can be, it, it's, it's a great tool. And it's robust and it, it just works. I love it. That's the one I was going to say too. I think that's what I said on the last seminar too. It's just it's so versatile and the functionality of it is so wonderful. And you get a four agile. port switch in there. Yeah, yeah, but you got to remember to configure that switch before you put it on a redundant system. <laughs> very good point. Very very good point. Made that yeah. mistake. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to do this again and dive into that more specifically, but. Uh, we're here 10 minutes past the hour, so I think we'll cut it off there. I appreciate you guys for being here so much. Um, everybody that joined us, thank you guys for being here. To my sure team in the background, uh, Jen and Ben um, and uh, Nick and Mark and Ryan and everybody everybody here from sure. Thank you guys for helping us wrangle the questions and send the links in the chat and all of those things. Again, Brian, Kirk, you guys were awesome. Uh, tons of feedback from the, the attendees right now saying thanks. We had a lot of people today. So it was a good topic and, and you kept them all here. So we appreciate that. A little bit of housekeeping before we leave. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. Our pro tech talks have moved to the first and third Tuesday of the month. So that will be next Tuesday. This is our open forum where you can come and ask myself, Jen and Ben, our pro market development team, pretty much anything audio related that you need answered. Uh, we, we try to uh, explain any of those questions you have and get them answered. And if we can't, we try to get back to you with those questions as well. So open forum discussion. Friday workflow series continues. We've moved this, as I mentioned earlier, to the second and fourth Fridays. This was our first installment of that second Friday. The fourth coming up, the September 25th, we are going to be behind the scenes at the ACMAs. Um, so that show's happening next Wednesday on the 16th. And on the 25th, we're going to follow up with um, some of the guys that were there uh, and how their workflow was, what it looked like, the award show in COVID, all of those things. Uh, and October 9th will still working out. So be sure to register for the September 25th, sure.com webinars, our tech talk next Tuesday. And with that, I conclude our Dante deep dive today. Again, Brian and Kirk, you guys were awesome. 
thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Happy, have a good weekend, guys. Happy Friday. Thanks, you too. See you, everybody. Yeah.